now we're about to welcome to the stage a real rock star. Deborah Fisher happens to be a rock drummer, but that's her night job. Uh, her day job is Planet Hunter. Please tell me, please tell me your business card says Planet Hunter. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Planet Hunter astronomer who teaches at Yale University. She's discovered hundreds, oh, we have a Yale fan out there. All right, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't get into Yale, but I'll let you clap. Um, she's discovered hundreds of planets orbiting other stars and is now intensely searching for rocky planets orbiting our closest neighboring star system, Alpha Centauri A and B, which are 4.7 light years from the sun, where conditions might be right for the existence of life. So let's bring her to the stage, Deborah Fisher. Uh, yeah, I think my day job is actually drumming and I won't quit it. <laughs> for my night job, which is finding planets around nearby stars. Um, and I want to start by reminding you all of this view that we have on our planet that we're all familiar of, of the setting sun, because I'm going to be showing you pictures of planets uh, sort of looking towards their suns as well. And all of these images are, have been created by Lynette Cook, who um, is an artist that works with our science group. And she translates our data into images that are more familiar to, to, to normal people. <laughs> Um, and, but before I go on to those other worlds, I want to pause and let you appreciate what our own solar system is like so that we can compare our solar system to these other planetary systems. And let me first start by asking you, do you think our solar system is normal, typical, or is it weird in some ways? So that's, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to answer that question at the end of my talk. Um, but first I want to talk about the scale of our solar system because it's something I graduated with my PhD. My kids were in you know, school and I was going in and, and helping out. And when the kids did a, a scale model of the solar system and we had these, you know, the sun is the size of a beach ball. So the sun is here, big beach ball, right? And then the earth is just a little peppercorn. Um, the most, it was really amazing. I had learned all of the sizes, all of the distances, but to see these kids running across the playground with the peppercorn, I realized how vast and empty our solar system seemed. So on this scale, where the sun is the size of a beach ball, you often see a picture of the planet next to the star, right? Because the artist has to fit everything on one page. But in fact, uh, if you took this little peppercorn, you'd be running out in the scale out to the street, you know, in front of, in front of the, um, the art gallery here. And so think about that for just one moment. All of the energy that we get on our planet, right, comes from the sun. And so the sun is radiating its energy. That energy is going out in a big sphere, and it's falling off as one over distance squared. But somehow this little peppercorn of a planet is at just the right distance for life to have evolved on this world. Okay, it's at a distance where if we had taken this peppercorn and moved it closer to the sun, it would have been too hot and our oceans would have evaporated. If it was much further away from the sun, any water would have been frozen into uh, uh, oceans of ice. Uh, so it's at just the right distance to have liquid water, important for the formation and evolution of life. And the other important thing is that this little peppercorn planet orbits in nearly a circular orbit. That's not true of some of the other planets that we're finding. Often they're on elliptical orbits and they come diving in close to the star where it gets very hot and then go out to the distant uh, reaches of the solar system where it's very cold. So, uh, so that's the backdrop. And this is a picture that I took from Chile uh, where I'm carrying out the, the search for planets around Alpha Centauri and I'll come back to that in my last slide. So this is a, the artist's rendition of a planet, the first planet that was found around another star. Okay, so this star here um, is 51 Pegasus, and it's very similar to our sun. Like our sun, it has these large coronal loops in the atmosphere that break and, and send out uh, solar radiation, a solar wind to the planet. But unlike our solar system, the big gas giant planet that you see here um, 51 Pegasi B, because 
there are so many planets, it's, it was too hard to come up with names for all of them. We, the star gets the label A, and the planets are named like Dr. Seuss characters, the little planet B, C, D, E, and so forth. So in this case, the planet orbits in just a little over four days. One year for any creature on this planet would be four days, okay, around the planet. But because the planet's so close to the star, the temperature, at least in the upper part of the atmosphere, is over 1,000 degrees. So this is a place that's likely too hot for life to have formed. It's a star and planetary system that's uh, about 40 light years away. So is there anyone in the audience who's 40 years old? <laughs> Wants to admit it? <laughs> um, so the, the light from the star, if you were to go out and look at 51 Peg tonight, would have, that means it would have left that star uh, at the same time you're born, 40 years ago, and is now arriving uh, at our planet um, and where we're, we have our telescopes trained on it to intercept the light. And we, we find the planets not by imaging them, even though these look like images. What we actually see is the wobble of the star over time as it's uh, being tugged around by the planet and orbiting a common center of mass. So 51 Peg is the first uh, planet in the lineup that was discovered. This star, Gliese 876, here with two planets, okay, is about 14 light years away. So anybody in the audience 14 years old? <laughs> the light from the star left that we're seeing right now left 14 years ago. Uh, and and this, uh, the, the large gas giant planet orbits its star about once every 30 days. And the planet um, where, we're, where we're viewing from our perspective uh, orbits every 60 days. So these planets are really quite close to each other, with the inner one you know, clocking around twice for every one-year, 60-day, uh, one-year orbit for, for this planet. Um, since this planetary system was discovered and the artist uh, made this drawing, we discovered one more planet. So she didn't know about it, but it's actually in a, an orbit that's just a little over one day, and it has a mass that's about seven times the mass of our Earth. Most of the planets we've detected are fairly large, like Neptune or Saturn or Jupiter in our own solar system. Um, because this is a low-mass star, a red dwarf, uh, the amount of gravitational pressure is less. It has less mass, and that means that the nuclear fusion rates at the core of the star are, are fewer than in our sun. It gives off less energy. And so now, if you want to be in the habitable zone around an M-dwarf star, you've got to move that peppercorn planet closer to the star so that you intercept enough energy and radiation for liquid water um, to reside on the, on, the planet of the, of the, on the surface of the planet. Um, at an Earth-sun distance, uh, around an M-dwarf, the planet would be frozen. This is actually my favorite system. It was one of the first systems that I worked on as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, this is a, a picture of the Upsilon Andromeda system. So th that's the name of the star, Upsilon Andromeda. And the star is something like 30 light years away. Uh, and you can see that there are, in this image, three planets that are depicted. And the first planet that was discovered is the one, was the one closest to the star, and it orbited in 4.71 days, was one year for that planet. And my job was to try and now, uh, as we collected more data, to come up with a model that would fit uh, the data, the radial velocities for both this planet, and we knew that there was a, a fairly massive planet in a two and a half year orbit. And so I tried uh, and failed. Uh, and found out that the reason is that when I subtracted the velocities from these planets, that there was one more nice little sine wave left in the data, and it was from this middle planet, an in, in, uh, intermediate planet that we hadn't expected. The outer planet is four times the mass of our Jupiter, so it's a fairly beefy planet. Uh, the middle one is two times the mass of our Jupiter, and then the, the one closest to the star is about a half of a Jupiter, which is still 150 times the mass of our Earth. And when this uh, announcement came out, it was 1999, I, I got a letter from a, a fourth grade class in Moscow, Idaho, 
And they wrote and said, Dear Dr. Fisher, we've been studying astronomy in our class, and we're making uh, paper plate models of the solar system. And our teacher brought in a story telling us about this discovery of a planetary system. And so we wondered if you had names for them yet, because, of course, we have suggestions. Um, <laughs> We think that this one, the, the most distant one, which is four times our Jupiter, should be named Forpiter, which is pretty <laughs> clever, right? And then the one that's two times Jupiter should, of course, be Tupiter, right? And then the one that's a half of a Jupiter should, of course, be Dinky. That was it, okay? <laughs> so I gave the discovery talk at NASA Ames and was followed by a whole string of theorists. I'm an observer. I, I find the planets, and then the theorists explain how they got there. And so uh, Doug Lynn, who was a professor, came up, and we, we didn't have a naming convention yet. So he tried at first saying, well, we'll call them A for the star, B, C, D. But he got confused in his presentation, and he said, look, uh, the, the, the dynamics of the system are such that if Forpeter uh, gets too close to Tupiter, it's all over, and Dinky will be ejected from the system. <laughs> So that, this was the first and I think the only time that planets, extrasolar planets, have actually been named. Um, that was all well and good until one of my colleagues went to, I think it was Space Telescope, where he was giving a talk and he said, oh yeah, my, my colleague Deborah Fisher calls them Tupiter, Forpiter, and Dinky, without any explanation that this was a fourth grade class, right? And so someone in the audience raised their hand and said, how old is Deborah Fisher? <laughs> not a topic of discussion. <laughs> this next uh, system is actually uh, a picture of a planetary system around a neutron star. So you just heard in the last talk that stars live for a long time. So our, st our sun, our star, will live for about 10 billion years, but eventually they evolve. And some of them explode uh, in these uh, fantastic supernova explosions especially uh, the, the stars that are more massive than our sun. And so the remnant of, a, of one of these um, evolutions or, or supernova explosions can be a neutron star, which is a very tiny core of the former star that's spinning so rapidly that a plasma uh, emits a sort of synchrotron radiation, a plasma of electrons. And here you see uh, there are one, two, three planets that have been discovered around this star. And they're about the mass of our Earth, and they're kind of at Earth-like distances. And so it's, it's pretty amazing, you might say, that these three planets could survive a supernova explosion. And in fact, they didn't survive a, a supernova explosion. Any planet that had been there when the star started to evolve would have been blown away and destroyed, obliterated. Uh, instead, what happened is that as this material blew off the outer shell of the star, it settled into a disk and new planets formed. And so these uh, most planets, the planet that we're living on, is a planet that formed during the birth of our star. These planets formed during the death of this star, this neutron star. So it's pretty dramatic because it tells us that this process of planet formation is very robust. Right? It happens even in fairly extreme conditions, and that makes us optimistic that probably most stars have planets, not only planets, but whole planetary systems around them. Here's a view um, with some artistic license of, uh, you see a double star system, 16 Cygnus uh, A and B, uh, and here the perspective is from a moon that's orbiting the planet 16 sig b. Okay, so that, this is where the artistic license comes in. The, the moon it's, wasn't discovered, but the planet was discovered orbiting one of these stars. And these two stars actually orbit each other. They're members of what's called a binary star system. So two stars orbiting each other, orbiting a common center of mass, really. And so our sun uh, is perhaps a little unusual in that it's a single star. Uh, something like half of the stars in the galaxy have actually companion stars. And you can see here that we discovered a planet orbiting one of these stars, and something like 20 or 30 percent of the known extrasolar planets actually orbit one component, 
of a binary uh, star system. So this uh, sort of harkens to a movie you might have seen recently, Avatar, right? Where the Navi lived on a planet that was orbiting a gas giant uh, in a double star system, the Alpha Centauri system, in fact. Uh, this is an icy moon, but in the, in the movie, of course, it was a, a moon that had oceans of water and it was at just the right distance. So here's the view that they might have had, not only of the giant planet that would have loomed in their sky, but also of the two stars that orbited each other as well. So a very uh, complicated and beautiful sky. Um, and this finally, uh, I, I lifted a picture from, from Avatar. And so you can see the spacecraft that's hovering above the moon, uh, orbiting Pandora in the Alpha Centauri system. Um, and my project, my latest project, is actually in Chile, where I took that first picture of the sunset. And I have 200 nights of telescope time a year where I'm looking at Alpha Centauri A. We nod back and forth, Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B. My colleagues say it's the most boring program they've ever heard of, but you know, it's, that's what it's going to take. Because we know that uh, the James Cameron picture of, of a gas giant planet in the system is not right that we would have discovered that planet if it had been there. But there's still room for small rocky planets. A system like Venus, Earth, and Mars could actually exist orbiting either or both Alpha Centauri A. And so that's what we're after. This is a star system that's our nearest neighbor, just a little over four light years away. And so I really do imagine that if we're successful and we find planets orbiting these stars, that not too uh, much later, it will be one of NASA's missions to try and figure out how we can send a spacecraft to the system. And if we do, you can imagine that it might be something like a cell phone. In fact, a whole army of cell phones, right? Because all you need to do is accelerate it to some speed. Let's say we might be able to do a hundredth the speed of light, so it'll take 400 years to get there. You have to be patient. Um, if we could go a tenth the speed of light, okay, which I'm really hoping for, then we could get there in 40 years, and it just takes four years to, to radio the signal back. So I've got my son lined up to go to MIT and work on the robotics project, which he said he would have liked to do until I told him he had to do it. So, um, <laughs> But then you just need to have this little fleet of small uh, cell phones fly through the system, snap pictures, you know, and then phone home, radio back the signal that they see. And of course, you wouldn't send one because it might be taken out. The space telescope would probably send 100. And because it's so hard to radio the signal back, you might send a series of fleets, so you send the first fleet of probes, followed by another fleet, maybe several years behind, so that you just have to transmit back, right, and, and uh, through a whole series, uh, send back a signal. So if we go any place, I think this is where we'll go, to Alpha Centauri, uh, in, in our travels, which will uh, maybe be in the next 100 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm.